time for determining the number of ANDAs approved? So any date you are fixing to classify into major, minor, uh, medium, or smaller scale? Um, so if I'm if I'm understanding you right, the question is: At what point does this program fees? Right. At what point in time does the program fee start to count? So if you own the if you own an approved ANDA as of October one, that's when it'll count. So if you get rid of something September fifteenth. It's not going to count against you, or it's not going to count for you, whichever, as of October 1. So let's say that you have six approved ANDAs and you want to get into the small category. You need to get rid of one, either by withdrawing it or selling it to someone else, before October 1. If you do that October 3rd, not going to help. You'll still be in the medium category because you're above that number. So you mean to say that we can withdraw an ANDA, still it will not count? If we, we have our first person who's buying you all a drink tonight. Okay. So I'm sorry. <laughs> I'm sorry. I'm just kidding. So I'm sorry. What was the question? No. If I if I withdraw a ANDA, still it will not count, no. Right. So if you withdraw the ANDA, it will yeah. not count as part of your your bucket, if you will, for your tier purposes. Thank you. Yep. All right. Over to microphone number one. Please step up very close to the microphone. Lisa Parks with Association for Accessible Medicines, AAM, formerly GPHA. Question for Colonel Parks. Um, you had indicated in your presentation that the uh, second posting will include um, approvals from March 1st, I believe? Up through March 10th. March 10th. So for those applicants or those ANDA sponsors who have already submitted their um, clarifications or what, whatever, um, they are more inclined to look at it look at the information again to make sure that if they had approvals in that interim from January to March, that they would also capture that as well. So let me restate this just to make sure. Um, is the intent of the agency that people who have had recent approvals will still check their information, even if they've already submitted? Yes. So when we submit, when we publish this new list coming up, hopefully sometime soon, we're encouraging everyone to go back and check. So because if you sent something in, we could have if it was a PDF and we couldn't read it in, we may have fat fingered something and made a mistake. So you want to make sure we didn't do that. If you've had withdrawals, you want to make sure those are reflected. If you've had new approvals, you want to make sure those are reflected. So yeah, please do check your, your data. And with that, since you're updating that information, this is really not a separate question. OK. <laughs> so, so those two are splitting the tab. <laughs> okay, Very quickly, please. Lots of people online. So because the information is being updated with the second posting, we have been informing our members to, um, if you're going to be calculating the potential and uh, program fee, to go ahead and calculate that. But it may not be the figure that we will see come August. Is that correct? Yeah, so this is something I didn't talk about. I meant to, but I forgot. Um, so when we post this new version next week or whenever it is, Anybody with rudimentary abacus skills can go in and figure out what the program fee is going to be. Because this is going to tell you how many are in the large, how many are in the medium, how many are in the small. But if you do that, you need to understand it's not going to be right when we publish the fees in August, because the numbers are constantly changing. So we're going to be you know, continuing to reflect withdrawals, approvals, transfers of ownership, et cetera. And that's going to keep going. That activity will keep going. And then as the first questioner asked, it's your status as of um, October 1 that's going to count. So all this stuff is fluid. We, however, need to have a number in June so we can do the denominators so that the Office of Financial Management can calculate the fees in time to get it published, in time, you know, blah, blah, blah. There's a whole chain of events here. So we're getting the information as best, as clean as we can in June, but there will still be changes after that. So if any of you are tempted to run the numbers, you can get a number, but just understand that that's not going to be the number. So thank you. Okay, before we come back to the room, let's get a, our first online question, please. Now, this will be to Ted. I submitted a controlled correspondence by email recently and haven't received a reply within seven days. What's the best way to follow up with the FDA to confirm they received the controlled correspondence? To do with acknowledgement of a controlled correspondence. And the best thing is to actually the email the ANDA account. So it's the same account that the controlled correspondence went to. And there's staff members there that can go back and verify whether or not the control had been submitted successfully. Okay. 
Next question in the room, please, over at microphone number two. So up until about two months ago, we have been a CMO. We now have acquired a company that holds its own ANDAs. So um, we've always paid the FDF fee, um, but now we are going to have a affiliation with a company who owns ANDAs, but also be a CMO for multiple pharmaceutical companies across the country. So will we be required to pay FDF fees and ANDA fees? It's to me. Um, so the question is, if you are manufacturing or products for um, a broader range of um, customers, yourself and others, are you going to have to pay both FDF fees and ANDA fees is what I heard you ask, right? Yes. Yeah. So the answer is if you're submitting an ANDA, yes, you'll have to pay that ANDA fee. If you're manufacturing, you'll have to pay a facility fee. Either the CMO fee, if you're not affiliated with the owners of any of the products you're manufacturing, or the full FDF facility fee if you are, if you own those ANDAs or you're affiliated with the owners of those ANDAs. Okay. Does that make sense? It does. Okay. Thank you. All right. Microphone number one, please, sir. Step right up. Uh, this question is for Donald. Uh, this is related to, is there a uh, data lock point for calculating the denominator to calculate the program fees? And th the second part of question is, if some company moves from tier one to tier two to tier three during that, uh, after that data lock point to uh, September 30th. So what is the provision that at end of the first cohort uh, that it will be recalculated or reconciliation will be done so that it is equally you know, uh, calculated for each of the firms. So let me restate to make sure I'm understanding. The, the question is, after we calculate the denominators in June, which then go into calculating the fees, which are released in August, and then they don't kick in until October, there's a several months span between each of those points. I think your question is, is the fee recalculated based on movement from one tier to another within that time frame? Is that right. correct? Yes, so the question, the answer is no. Um, and that's why we're trying to get the data as clean as we can in June, but we recognize that things will change before October 1. So the fee is going to be the fee as of with the information we have in June. What you as an individual company actually owe in October is a function of your particular status of you know, the number of approved ANDAs that you own at that time. So we do not go back and recalculate the fees. We don't rejigger that number at all. Um, the information we have in June is what we have. And that's what we have to work with. Sure. Thank and you. that's largely because of the time. We just don't have time to redo that. Sure. Thanks. Okay, thanks. Okay, for the folks in the room, if you have any questions, there's a, a microphone two is open. Before we come back to microphone one, though, let's go with an online question, please, Ray. This is for Jonathan. Beginning May the 5th, if a new ANDA has a minor ECTD deficiency, Will the agency still afford the applicant an opportunity to correct them via screening deficiency comments, or will that ANDA be subject to immediate refusal? So, um, the, really, the answer to that. Can you to repeat that, the question, please? Yeah. So, um, <laughs> so the the question is about if there's a ECTD deficiency. Uh, May, starting May 5th or after May 5th, will the applicant have an opportunity to fix the deficiency before they're RTR'd? Um, and um, really, the, uh, tomorrow, the Division of Filing Review is presenting. And they are the best group to respond to that type of question. So I'll leave it there. So, so you're deflecting? Um, I'm deflecting to the area of most expertise. Perfect. Excellent. So reasons to come back tomorrow. Anybody Absolutely. else on the panel have anything to add to that? All right, next question, microphone number one. Please step right up close to the microphone for me. Um, hi, I'm Brian Hockley from the University of Michigan, and this is a question for Mr. Parks. Um, so you mentioned that state agencies, organizations, are exempt from GDUFA fees. Um, I wonder they were, however, conspicuously absent from the CMO flowchart. If we function as both a ANDA holder, uh, and obviously a state agency, but also a CMO for an outside entity, how does that change or how does that affect the fee status? 
So the question, if I'm understanding right, is given the new exemption in GDUFA 2 for state entities submitting applications, does that then convey over to the CMO fee for the manufacturing process? So the, there's different fees here. So the exemption for state entities applies to the ANDA fee. So if you're a state entity, you don't pay the ANDA fee. However, if I recall the draft statute correct, correctly, there's no such exemption also for the fee on the facilities. So a state entity could get an exemption from the and a fee when submitting the application, but once it's approved, the facility where it's made will have to pay an, a facility fee. It could be either the CMO fee or the full FDF fee. Does that make sense? It's not the answer you wanted, I can tell, but. Uh, no, it, it does make sense. I hadn't considered the, that we would be subject to the full, the full fee as well. Well, you might. So, I mean, if you're manufacturing your own application, then I don't think there's any exemption in there for um, state entities owning it. So, mm. all right. Thank you. Sure. Okay. Next online question, please. And for those of you in the room, uh, both microphones are open. Feel free to uh, step up if you've got questions for any of the three speakers. Next question. This question is for Donald. If the information in the Excel sheet is correct, is the agency expecting us to communicate to them that it is correct or accurate? So the question is, in the files that we're posting online, if the information is correct, are we expecting a response? The short answer is no. You don't need to. The longer answer is, if you would like to um, help us sleep better at night, you can say, hey, this is correct. We're good. So you don't have to. Um, but if you could, we would certainly appreciate that. This will go to Jonathan. To what extent does the agency require text searchable documents in an ANDA? The question is, to what extent the agency requires text searchable documents in an ANDA? So this really comes back to um, when sponsors submit PDF files um, in their submission. Um, we have a PDF specifications, which is part of the ECTD requirements, uh, which is accessible on our ECTD website. At www.fda.gov slash ectd. Uh, there you can read this PDF specifications. And what it states is that um, you should uh, create PDFs from things like Word documents, for example. Um, if you find that you have to scan, then what we look for is for you to use uh, something like OCR. Uh, to convert the image to text so that the text is actually searchable, so that the reviewers can search for things, so that they can cut and paste um, out of there, because all of these things um, help with the efficiency of the review process. Um, so if you um, submit a PDF document um, and it's just an, in the text, it's just an image and it's not OCR'd, or, um, then I think you really could expect that the Division of Filing Review is going to come back uh, and ask you to resubmit those documents. Thank you. Are you going to post unclaimed ANDAS? And if so, when and where? So the question is, are we going to post unclaimed ANDAs? And if so, when and where? So the um, second tab of the file that we're hoping to post this week or early next will contain um, four tabs, one of which is the list of um, approved ANDAs from whose owners we have not heard yet. And so that'll be in there as soon as we can get that out that, that file out there on the web. Thank you. Yep. Okay, next online question, please. So, I'm sorry, we had a question here. Oh, so what was the website? Is that what the word? Yeah, so the website's going to be fda.gov slash GDUFA. That's our, our landing page for the user fees. And it's, um, well, for a lot of stuff, but it's got a, um, a sort of a what's new box in the middle. And then down probably right below the first screen is going to be where that file will be posted. If you go there now, you'll see the one from January, and that's going to just push this one down. So, sorry. Oh, that's perfect. Next online question, please. Sure. This question is for Donald. If ANDA, if an ANDA is approved and not commercialized, do we still need to pay an ANDA annual program fee? Since some of the approved ANDAs are not commercialized, these fees will be additional burden, non-recoverable on small and medium entities. 
So the question is, if Ananda is approved but not commercialized, is the program fee still going to apply or will that approved ANDA still be counted into the bucket for the owner? Um, the short answer is yes. Uh, the draft statutory language I don't think includes any reference to whether something is commercialized or not. So if you do have an approved ANDA and you for whatever reason really need that not to count, then the only way to get rid of it is to transfer it to someone else or to withdraw it. Otherwise it will count. Thanks. Okay, over to microphone number two, please. Yeah, I have a question for Jonathan. Um, if an ECTD is rejected because of uh, uh, the third acknowledgement, wherein validation uh, requirements are not successful, what is the agency's expectation for resubmission of that uh, uh, sequence? It has to be submitted as an amendment to that uh, sequence, or it has to be submitted as a resubmission? So great question. The, uh, the question is, if uh, an ECTD submission comes in and it fails the validation criteria, um, you know, what, what is the process? What should the sponsor do in ter terms of resubmitting it? Do they resubmit it as an amendment, or what do they do? Uh, so in this case, uh, because the submission has not made it to the review division, it has gotten a technical rejection before it even gets there. Uh, the sponsors should just resubmit that sequence. They can use the same sequence number uh, and just address the errors in that sequence. Excellent. And again, in the room, if you have any questions, uh, go ahead and feel free to step up to the microphone. Let's go to our next online question, please. This is for uh, Jonathan. Has the FDA published any validator type of software to the public to validate ECTD submissions? So the question is, has the FDA published uh, validation software uh, that's available in industry, right, for industry to use? So the, the FDA does not uh, get into um, promoting one uh, vendor's tools versus another. Uh, what we do say is that if you do a search, you can do a search through Google on the, on the internet uh, for ECTD validation software, you will see that there are a variety of vendors that offer this functionality. All righty, next online question, please. This question is for Ted. What is the average time of total review of an ANDA? With the average time of total review, and, and we'll sort of assume that it's getting into the time it takes to do the full approval. Right now, it varies tremendously from application to application. And as we said, the newer applications are being approved faster. But the sort of cohort of the more traditional applications being approved, some of these older ones, is up to about 40 months. The newer cohorts, as we've seen, is dropping well below that. And the statistics we showed earlier were the first cycle approvals are being done in about 15 months. All of those actually include time with industry. And that's just an artifact of the way the agency reports the data. So if we issue a deficiency through a complete response, the time it takes the company to respond also counts against that total approval time that the agency reports. Thank you. Okay, microphone number one, please step right up close. Hi, this question is for Donald. Um, given that the success at Jadufa One that was presented earlier uh, that was able to meet their target goals with the $323 million budget over the period of five years, what was the rationale or the thought process or discussion that went on as to why there's a 52% increase in Jadufa Two? So the question is, why was there a jump in the program size from the uh, end of Gadufa 1 to the beginning of Gadufa 2, which amounted to a 52% increase? Um, I actually don't have any insight into that. I was not part of the negotiating team, and that's, it was during those negotiations that that number was derived. So um, Ted was more involved with that. So if he doesn't mind, I'll punt it over to him. The question relates to the increase in size of the program itself. Right? Gadufa 2 is a larger program, all the fees compiled together. And that has to do with sort of the set of negotiated responsibilities that FDA is assuming in addition to what was negotiated for GDUFA 1. So there were several areas, and we talked a little bit this morning about the pre-facility communication. Those type of activities are additive to GDUFA 1. So that's the culmination of all of those extra asked of the agency. That's what resulted in the increase in fee. The agency and the trades work together to figure out what do we want and how much do we think it's going to cost. 
to build that to meet the expectations to hit it the 90% of the time. Online question, please. Okay, this question is for Ted. What are the current options for sponsors for pre and a meetings? There is a current program for that. It's it's very immature and compared to what we're going to be doing under Gadufa 2, but for companies who do have a more non-traditional type of product where the bioequivalent standard isn't out in guidance or the company needs to deviate significantly from that or is very complex because of the nature of the dosage form, the best thing to do is to submit a request for the meeting to the OGD account and that's the same account that you would be using for controlled correspondence and other communications to the agency. So at this point in time we are meeting with a small number of applicants who sort of fit the definition of having one of these non-traditional type of products. Thank you. Okay, and for the folks in the room, just in case I scared anybody off earlier, if you have a second question, you go to the end of line and wait again. You don't have to pay for any drinks, so you're welcome to get back up and do that. So if you do have any questions in the room, feel free to stand up the microphones. Let's go with our next online question. This was addressed to Denal. When FDA defines approved ANDAs under GDUFA 2, does this definition include tentatively approved ANDAs as well? So the question is, when we talk about program fee in uh, terms of the number of approved ANDAs that someone has, are we, are we including tentative approvals? My understanding of the draft statutory language is that no, we are not. Um, I could be wrong on that, but I don't think so. I don't think we're including those. Okay, hey, microphone number one. Step Ted up. says I'm right, so I'm right. Okay. <laughs> there you go. Lisa Parks with Association for Accessible Medicines. This mess, uh, this question is for Ted. Uh, we've been hearing as an industry a lot of uh, kind of talkings about uh, the complex products and pre-submission meetings. Um, has the agency done any capacity building or projections to how many? pre-submission meetings that the FDA would be able to grant at the time uh, GDFA 2 starts until probably fifth year of GDFA 2? The question has to do with how much capacity planning is the agency doing to gear up towards GDFA 2. And because the GDFA 2 is, is still in the legislative arena right now, we, we can't speak to what's beyond the legislation, there, there's certainly numbers that are outlined. If all that goes well, then the agency certainly is trying to gear itself to be in a position on October 1st to start working on these. There's a, a ramp up that goes through and certainly the expectation is that companies have a legitimate package. But at this point we are looking to be able to manage several dozen of these types of meetings uh, starting with the first fiscal year of GDUFA 2. So that will be starting in October. Okay, microphone number two please. This question is for Ted. In the mutual recognition agreement, you mentioned that the FDA would accept EU inspections. Is that vice versa also, that the EU would accept an FDA inspection? Uh, unfortunately, the inspection process isn't something that the Office of Generic Drugs is able to comment on. That we would have to refer to the Office of Compliance. They have been working in the international arena to strengthen relationships both ways. Um, but at this point in time, there's still some steps that need to be accomplished before we're going to reach that equilibrium. Thank you. Okay, next online question, please. And this was addressed to Jonathan. What is the agency's recommendation with regards to handwritten text and executed batch records? So the, the question is, what's the agency's recommendation uh, in regards to handwritten text on uh, batch records? Um, so uh, if you have, if you have a, a batch record and it's, it's handwritten and you can't convert it uh, to text with, with OCR, um, you, what you want to do is make sure that it's very readable, that the reviewer is able uh, to be able to decipher what the text is so they can carry on their, their review. Um, because if they can't, then what's going to happen is they're going to ask you to resubmit that document and clarify things on it that they're unable to read. Um, 
So we recommend that um, you know sponsors through their internal processes that they when they capture this information that they capture it in in you know typed out text rather than handwritten notes on things. Thanks. Yep. Yeah, yeah please, well. Ted. So if you have a case like that where you're, you're sort of forced just because of the history of, of the application as it was developed, you certainly can put in accompanying language that explains what's going on and make that more searchable. You remember who your audience is when you're working on these applications. Right? The audience is the reviewer. So these are people who are very data driven. Right? If, if they start to see maybe there's something that's a little funny that requires additional investigation within that application, they're going to be searching your application to see when and where that shows up, how it's used. So help them make those types of assessments. So if you have something like that, you can do a little translation on the side and include both the, the translation and the original in the application itself. And certainly if you have a little bit of a justification as to why you have the original document and then the supplemental one, which is sort of translating what the original document is, that can be searchable if it's set up right. And those are very helpful tools for the reviewers, right? Because if they can't find it very easily, their next recourse is to send you a deficiency and then the whole thing starts all over again. So help them come to that conclusion that you know what's going on, you're able to show it in the application. Thank you. Okay, microphone number two, please. Uh, this question is for Donald Parks. Uh, just on the CMO evaluation, uh, if a CMO is uh, doing a CMO business for other players, as well as they have their own ANDAs, how the calculation would be calculated in that case? So uh, the question I think is if you're a CMO, if you're a facility and you are manufacturing for other players, people who own um, ANDAs with whom you're not affiliated, plus you own some ANDAs yourself, uh, let me ask a clarifying question. Are you manufacturing your own products at your facility as well? Yeah. Okay. So because of that fact, you're not a CMO. Just like with this uh, state-owned case earlier, if you own the application and you're manufacturing it at your facility, that facility will not qualify as a CMO. Now, this is kind of a tricky situation, but if you were in that situation and not manufacturing your own, but you were manufacturing others with whom you're not affiliated, you would still be a CMO. Yeah, uh, but in the case of like, uh, if I'm manufacturing for some third party people, mm -hmm. as well as my affiliate is also manufacturing my own products, then would all those be calculated as one company or so the the calcul so the question the follow up question was if um, third parties if I'm manufacturing for third parties and I'm manufacturing some of my own do those somehow are they additive somehow right so the the calculation really is binary are you manufacturing or not if you are are you manufacturing for yourself or only for others with whom you're not affiliated so in order to, well, if you're um, referencing an approved application as of October 1, you're considered a facility and you're subject to the facility fee. If you're providing FDF services, you're, you're going to pay the FDF facility fee. If you are manufacturing FDF for other ANDA holders and none for yourself at that site, then you qualify as CMO. So first it's, I'm referenced in an approved application, therefore I'm a facility. I'm providing FDF services, therefore I'm an FDF facility, but I'm only manufacturing for others and nothing for myself, then I can qualify for the CMO. Okay. So, okay. Thanks. Microphone number one, please. Yeah. Uh, this question is for Ted. Uh, regarding the mutual inspection uh, from other agencies, uh, so in order to, like when, we, when somebody is filing an AND or some firm is filing an AND, at that time, it has to be mentioned in the ANDA so that agency knows that it has been recently inspected by EMEA or PMDA or TGA so that like, a decision can be made whether the sites which are referenced in your ANDA um, uh, need inspection or not. So, so help me with this one. It, it sounds like you're asking whether there's registration is going to the other entities. So if, if you're making a US FDA product. So question is related to whether as agency is going to accept the inspection conducted by other regulatory agencies from EMEA, PMDA, or TGA in order for agency to know whether 
the facility which is uh, we are referring in our ANDS submission has been recently inspected by those regulatory agencies. Sh are we required to include that inspection um, dates or inspection outcomes in the ANDA so that a decision can be made whether it's the site reference in the ANDA needs an inspection or not? So it sounds like the question is, is there an obligation on the applicant to disclose the recent inspection and inspection status from other entities? That, that's not a requirement for submission of an ANDA. Uh, you know, certainly the more information we have about an application, its facility history and standing, that can help us work with the appropriate regulatory agencies. In certain cases, we have relied on other agencies to make the decision if the applicant or their contract manufacturer is in a hard to reach area or, or one that's a little bit difficult for federal travelers to go to, then periodically we'll rely on others. You know, if you think you have an application that fits that, you are certainly welcome to provide additional information about the health and standing of that facility, but is not a requirement. Thank you. Uh, can I ask? Yep, uh, real quick. Uh, yeah, next question is for Jonathan. Uh, for NC minus one products, like you said, uh, it depends upon uh, the technical rejection, whether the, when there is a manual um, processing is involved in the, in processing the uh, application. At that time, um, if it is NC minus one, is there a special consideration given to, uh, to the submission so that, you know, it doesn't, applicant is not informed the next day, otherwise he will lose his NC minus one date. So the, the question is about um, NC minus one. I'm not all that familiar with NC uh, minus one, so Ted might be able to help me out on that. So the question has to do with the, the screening of applications at the gateway level. They're really, at that point in time, the, the staff that are involved in processing those applications, they are not assessing to see whether it's an NC minus one or a more standard application. So th there's no extra attention given because it's unaware at that point in time. It, it's really not until the application has landed with the Office of Generic Drugs that we will start to do the assessment to determine what type of submission this really is. Sure. Thank you. Okay, we've got about two minutes left for questions in the room. Uh, one more online and then we'll come back to this microphone. This is for Donald. If a CMO has two Padufa customers and one Gadufa customer, how will faci facility fees be built. Uh, what is the link between Padufa and Gadufa for facility fees? So the question relates to how the different user fee programs play well with each other or not. And I think the specific question is if somebody manufactures both Padufa products and Gadufa products at one facility, what impact does that have? So in short, the two uh, user fee programs work completely independently. Um, and in the current Padufa, there would have been an establishment fee that was uh, incurred by the facility in Padufa 6, going forward, there won't be any establishment fees. And so in this particular case, there won't be any impact at all. The Gadufa fee will be a function of whether it's a CMO or you know whatever. Um, so it'll be independent of any interaction with Padufa or Adufa or Basufa or anything. Um, and so it's just the Gadufa portion for the generics fees portion that would be applicable. Yeah, okay, microphone number one, please. Yes, um, what's the definition of affiliate for in, in the uh, FDA's eyes? If one owner is manager or owner of, or part owner of some other entities, how is that assessed? So the, um, the statute defines affiliate, I'm sorry, the question was how is affiliate defined by the agency for purposes of the CMO fee? Um, the various user fee programs at the agency have the same definition of affiliate across the board, which is, I'm gonna try and recite this, I'll probably get it wrong, but if, a, um, if the same entity controls both, or if the same owner or entity has the power to control both, then they're affiliated. So in other words, if, if you're a company and through various mechanisms of your corporate structure, another body like a venture capital fund or some other big pharma company can decide things for you, then you're affiliated with that group and whoever else is affiliated with that group. So. It can be kind of tricky to apply this in practice. Um, you're probably the best positioned to know who your affiliates are because you know your corporate structure better than we do. Um, but we, um, 
we'll look at the affiliate relationship carefully to make sure that, yes, these two entities are um, affiliated directly or they're controlled by the same other third party or something like that. So the, statu the statutory definition, I think, was on one of my slides at the bottom of that uh, flowchart. Um, and that's really what we go back to every time we have to analyze this distinction. Okay, and Donald took us up right to the end of our time for the plant panel. Please help me thank the three gentlemen.